It's a pleasure to be here uh, in front of Grand Rounds again. And uh, as Wayne said, I'll be talking about post-analytic laboratory error cases, concepts, and interventions. And this is an overview of what I'm going to speak about today. I'm going to give some background information, a brief list of post-analytic errors, which as you know are errors that occur after we have the result. I'll talk about a useful way of classifying these errors, kind of a simple useful way, and a little bit on how organizations drift away from safety, and this is the work of Sidney Decker from the University of Lund. Then I'll present three cases uh, to motivate discussion, three cases of post-analytic errors, and we'll analyze those three cases in really two different ways. First, what should the disciplinary response be to those? Should people be punished? Should they be applauded? Uh, what is the correct response uh, to an error? and to error reporting. And then we'll look at the strength of various interventions aimed at reducing those errors. Lastly, I'll talk a little bit about critical values and I'll uh, uh, then have some conclusions um, related to the main topics covered. Now, significant errors occur in all phases of laboratory testing. And one of the things that um, really gets me going is that people like to argue about which phase is most important which phase is most important, pre-analytical, analytical, or post-analytical. And all phases of laboratory testing are equally important when it comes to errors, and we need to work on all of them. And this is a study we did a few years ago looking at stat chemistry errors, and there were um, plenty of pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic errors in the laboratories we studied at that time. The most important thing isn't what errors are most, uh, what phase of testing is most important with regards to errors. What's most important is finding the errors with the most patient impact in whatever institution you're working in and intervene. And today we're going to focus on post-analytic errors, errors that occur, errors that occur after a result is produced. Now this is a, a, a typical list of post, there's a lot of ways to classify post-analytic uh, errors. This is a, a fairly typical list of post-analytic errors. And post-analytic errors would include one or more of the following. So the, the, probably the most uh, common is the post-analytic data entry error, uh, oral miscommunication of results. And when I go through this list, I'm, I'm referring to errors that afflict every laboratory. You know, as the editor of a patient safety newsletter, people communicate with me uh, regarding errors that are occurring in their institutions. And I've chosen cases today and this list of errors that are common to all laboratories. So that when we look at interventions, hopefully the interventions could work for uh, most clinical laboratory facilities. So oral miscommunication of results, errors in reporting to a downstream printer, fax, or electronic medical record from our laboratory information system. Physician failing to, physician or other provider failing to retrieve the test result is a very common error. Failure to communicate a critical value. The misinterpretation of the lab result by a physician or other provider. In other words, they got the information, but then they misinterpreted it. And then there are a bunch of others that are less important, so I'll just concentrate uh, on these. And the three cases are, are uh, il illustrate uh, three of these. Now, post-analytic errors, like other errors, rarely reach the patient. There's enough safeguards in healthcare that um, the errors are usually blocked either by the lab who detects the errors before it leaves, leaves the lab, perhaps through delta checking, the MD or nurse uh, who re perhaps receives the laboratory result, for example, so per perhaps they receive a laboratory result of a hemoglobin of four in a patient who is perfectly ambulatory and is able to dance and prance into the office, looks healthy. And they look at that lab result and they say, that just cannot be true. And so they either disregard it or they retest. The patient themselves can block um, a laboratory error. So here's an error that's gotten out of the lab. The MD or nurse didn't pick it up, but the patient picked it up. Perhaps this is an error where a technologist has entered a laboratory result into the wrong patient's record. So now this patient is told that they have a particular abnormal laboratory test result, perhaps a high cholesterol, and the patient says, don't worry about it, that's not my result. No one took my blood. And so it's good to know as a patient, you know, we hear this a lot with regard to pharmacy errors. We hear this a lot with regard to pharmacy errors that patients should, you know, be aware of the drugs they're on and, you know, look at what they're being given. If you're in the hospital, look at the, at the bag, or the intravenous bag that's hanging to see what you're on. Similar with lab tests, it's very important to know which tests have been ordered you. And once in a while, like this error number four, it'll tra uh, traverse all barriers and produce what we call an adverse event, which is essentially patient harm. 
uh, or patient injury due to their to, to the laboratory error. Now, a very useful and simple approach to error classification that we've been applying some time and I think is useful to any laboratory is to um, look at er errors and try to classify them in one of two ways. The first way is errors can be classified as either lapses due to lapses in concentration or due to lack of knowledge. And, the, you know, there are fancy names for, uh, given for, the, uh, for these uh, terms, but from, from, we're going to try to speak in plain language. So we're looking at most post-analytical errors are due to lapses in concentration. So, you, you know, you're trying to do a task like type in your name. Here I've tried to type in my name. This is the correct spelling of my name. This is how I typed it in. And why can't I type my name correctly? It's not a knowledge deficit. I know my name. I know the spelling of my name. And I know how to type. But, but this is a very common error. I've, I've switched two letters. Very common error. Why can't I do it? Well, it's more likely that I've put myself in a situation through being in, uh, interrupted or high background noise, trying to multitask, being fatigued, that I'm unable to complete a task that is normally fairly automatic to me and which I normally get right. We will not be able to train me out of this error. There's no amount of typing school that we can send me to to get this right. And so it would be an inappropriate response to try to train me out of this error. Now, most panel, post -anal Analytical errors are of this type due to lapses in concentration, the failure to complete a task that is normally automatic, like communicating a lab result over the phone. We get it right the vast majority of the time, but when we get it wrong, it's rarely can we train our way out of that problem. Now, a small percentage of post-analytic errors are due to lack of knowledge. For example, if a physician misinterprets a test result uh, and takes the wrong action on the, uh, you know, for example, puts the patient on the wrong antibiotic, when they receive a correct laboratory result, a correct, say, blood culture result, that would be a knowledge error. And the, the reason we separate errors in this simple but useful way is that it keeps us from making an important error, uh, er a management error, which is to respond to all errors with training. And th this simple classification helps us choose the right uh, intervention strategy. So, Errors due to lapses in concentration, we use strategies to aid memory and avoid interruptions, distractions, and fatigue. So classically, you know, we try automation, removal of the phone for the labs, or various strategies for decreasing the number of phone calls into the lab. We try to simplify our procedures, decrease background noise. Checklists can be very helpful uh, to make as a memory aid. And of course, of course, this is the classic memory aid. The, you know, the string around the finger, and I don't know if anybody actually uses the string around the finger. I use variants of the string around the finger myself. For example, uh, I may need to, a lot of times during the day, various chores will accumulate. Like I'll remember that I have to go to Bartels and pick up a light bulb. So I'll, you know, I'll undo one thing on my belt. Then I got it, then, then I'll get a call. I got to bring home some milk. So I'll undo my cuff. Then I get a third thing. I'll undo like my, my the shoe string, the string on my shoe. By the time I'm walking home, my, foot, my clothes are falling off, <laughs> and I've overloaded myself with so many cues, with so many cues that I can't remember what I'm supposed to do. And that's a problem with the string around the finger. It's good, you know, it's good for maybe one string is good or two strings are good, but once you get to three, four strings, you can't even remember what they're for. You get um, an information overload. But that's a classic way, a, a memory aid. And, and errors that are due to lapses in concentration, these are the kinds of interventions we're looking at. And we can't train our way out of them. Now, what is training for? Well, there, when you lack knowledge, when your error is due to a lack of knowledge, then the, the interventions we tend to choose are things like increased supervision. So an example of this is perhaps certain rare results should not be reported out without a supervisor looking at them. You don't want to be, you know, you don't want to report out some kind of very rare organism that you've never seen before. You don't want it to be the first time you report that out, you would like to run that by a supervisor. So we res respond to errors due to lack of knowledge by increased supervision, and here's where training can be useful. But sometimes it's the case that even lack of knowledge errors can be dealt with through things like automation or other process improvements. For example, you know, your analysis is, can now be microscopic, your analysis or other microscope-based tasks can be sometimes eliminated 
through using automation. So if you have an error-prone microscope-based task that requires a lot of knowledge and can replace it by some direct measurement, uh, automation can actually uh, help decrease errors due to lack of knowledge because maybe we don't need the knowledge anymore. So you shouldn't rule out uh, automation uh, and some other process improvements for um, helping with knowledge errors. Now, one topic that's useful to look at when you're looking at organizations is how is it that organizations come to the point that they become more accident or error prone? And I'm thankful uh, to Dr. Sidney Decker for his work in this field. And he wrote an excellent book called The Field Guide to Human Error Investigations that is very helpful in looking at uh, or what's called organizational drift. And I'll show you how it basically works. So this is the safety level. And you start off, you're in a safe condition. And, that, and what I mean by that is the patients are basically in a fairly safe uh, condition. You, know, you have uh, good systems in place for uh, reducing errors, avoiding errors, and detecting errors before they reach the patient. And then you make a decision. Let's say you, know, you downsize the staff. You cut back on nursing or you cut back on laboratory staff. It's a small increment, the first of a series of small incremental decisions. And you make the decision and it seems to be okay. You wait a few weeks, nothing happens. No one's really getting hurt. Everything seems about the same. But you know, you've borrowed a little bit of sa from safety. You've borrowed just a little bit. Your staffing's down. You're, you've given over to money. You've given over to the revenue side, perhaps. I mean, to the, to the uh, expenditure side. You're saving some money. But you've borrowed a little bit from safety, but it seems like it's OK. So perhaps you were maybe even overstaffed. You're thinking to yourself, well, we were overstaffed. We haven't had an accident, because the accident occurs way down here when you're in the unsafe condition. Then you make, you know, a few months go by or a year goes by and you decide, you know, I think another way we could save some money uh, and, and maybe, you know, get rid of some work that doesn't need to be done. It's wasteful work is we can increase the instrument maintenance intervals. We, um, we look at the instruments too frequently. We're troubleshooting them too often. Uh, the manufacturer's guidelines are too tight. So you make that and now you're drifting again. That, but nothing happens. You seem to be fine. And... So you drift along. Then you make a third decision, maybe to delay instrument purchases or to delay interfaces between the instruments and the laboratory information system. And then a little bit later, you're drifting again, and now a, a bad accident happens. A bad accident happens. And what happens typically in this case, now like people come in from the outside, like a faculty member or a consultant comes in, and they come in and they're here. And they look at your organization and say, wow, look how deviant you are. Look how far you've drifted. But you don't know it. So you didn't know it because you're just, you know, you're drifting along. Everything's fine. You're inside and you don't see it. And so to avoid this drift, you have to look. You have to look hard at each decision, whether it's borrowing from safety. And you have to try to consider it and have a lot of different opinions in the room to question whether incremental decisions are, in fact, borrowing from safety. Because sometimes, you know, perhaps in increasing the instrument maintenance interval is a good idea. Perhaps it is a wasteful practice, not adding much, but other times it might not. So this is drift, usually a small series of incremental decisions that seem safe at the time, but are unsafe. And this, this pattern has been uh, shown to be uh, very prominent in airline accidents. Things like increasing um, maintenance intervals, a series of small de decisions that lead people away to a, to a condition where they're more likely to see accidents. So let me show you three composite cases. And by composite cases, I mean that through the newsletter and various pro professional organizations related to safety, I've received a lot of different cases. And these are sort of teaching cases. They're true, um, but they combine elements of more than one case in, in each case. And I've tr tried to choose cases that uh, afflict all laboratories um, across the United States. So first one is a data entry error. So a tech enters Jane Doe's troponin result in John Doe's electronic record. And you can see that John Doe and Jane Doe were in the emergency room at around the same time. 0452 for John Doe, 0450 for Jane Doe. And John Doe has got a negative result and Jane Doe has a high result. She's actually had a heart attack. But John Doe gets Jane Doe's result, is what happens. There's a data entry error, so John Doe gets a 250, and he's admitted to the ICU with an incorrect diagnosis of a myocardial infarction and receives unnecessary treatment. So he's nitrated and heparinized and monitored. This, this error, it's, it's interesting, when you talk to labs, most labs have some version of this error, can produce some case that's some version of this error. So it's just a, a classic data entry error. 
And here's a second case. Second case is an oral miscommunication of a pregnancy test result. Here we have a doctor calls the lab for a pregnancy test result, and the, the tech communicates an old negative result. See, here's the patient's result, Jane Doe. You can see her old result is less than three, which for this pregnancy result is a negative result. And the current result, which is 10 days later, is positive. It's positive. And so what the tech's done is look, just quickly glanced at the screen and um, called out the negative result. Now this is, there are a lot of versions of this particular error, but one we hear a lot about from readers of the newsletter is that a lot of times you're on the wrong screen. You're scrolling through a very long list of a test results. You think you're in the right place. You think you've reached the end of the journey. You uh, orally communicate the result, and it's not the right result. So in this case, the, the, we communicate a negative result rather than the current positive result, and this pregnant patient received medications that you don't give to a pregnant patient. So there's a lot of different versions of this, uh, of this error, uh, a fairly common error that afflicts um, clinical laboratories. And it's, it's a part of human nature that one of, the, one of the problems we have is that we make this sort of left-right, yes-no switch. You know, you know, you're thinking no, you're thinking no, you're thinking no, and you say yes. Or the gram stain's positive, the gram stain's positive, then you get on the phone and you say the gram stain's negative. And, and the pro, you know, when there's two results, you know, and you make an error, it's the other one, and then it has a completely different meaning. That's a problem that afflicts us. Third, the third error is the classic doctor forgets to follow up on an ordered test. So a doctor orders a test for C. diff, forgets to retrieve it. By the time the result, which is positive, reaches a provider, there's a delay, and the, uh, the hospitalized patient has a number of serious com complications for their diarrhea and ends up having a prolonged hospital stay. Doctor forgot to um, follow up on an ordered test. So now we have these three cases. First, let's look at the possible disciplinary responses. Now the natural human response is to blame. <laughs> you made a mistake. You made a mistake. We have got to come down on you. But you'll notice, those of you who've you know, been working for a long time, that this kind of error can you, you know, probably affect almost anybody, even the most competent employee, if we put them under enough stress and distract them enough. So who should be disciplined? Would you, would you discipline the tech who committed that data entry error? or the one who orally miscommunicated the pregnancy test result, or the forgetful doctor? Does the forgetful doctor, should that person be disciplined? All of them, should they all receive some kind of pay, you know, demotions, shaming? Should we shame them out in the public square? And the answer in, in all three cases is probably not. In no case, in, in most cases of all three of those errors, there would be no disciplinary action, and that would be the correct response. Now, I'll show you that sometimes there's an exception to that, and I'll show you that exception. But for, run of the, for those types of errors in general, that could afflict almost anybody who works in a healthcare environment, because believe me, every doctor at some point has forgotten to follow up on an order test result, and it is not incompetence that, that makes that happen. In these cases, it, we would rarely, not never, but rarely discipline. And that leads me to a discussion of culture. You know, what kind of culture you want around uh, error detection and uh, discipline of people who commit errors. And culture is probably the most important intervention. It's more important than automation and leaning the lab and elimination of steps. It's the most important intervention because for any of these interventions to take place, you, ha they ha you have to have the right culture to accept them. And I, I picked out this quote from a website I like from Dr. Peter Pronovo, who's worked a lot on patient safety culture. And he says, we have found that without culture change, you cannot reorganize work or implement safety practices because people are not playing in the sandbox together. So you have to try to, you have to fertilize the ground before you can make important patient safety changes. Now, the old way of looking at errors, the old way is to basically be a blame, shame, and train culture. Blame, shame, and train. So you point out to a person they're doing it wrong, shame them a little bit, and then try to train their way out of it. And that approach has failed. So a newer approach is sort of blame-free. Kind of, a, it's never your fault. And that doesn't work either. That doesn't work either. Why? Because some people come to work impaired. There are certain things that happen where people need to be blamed. So blame-free doesn't work either. Um, now, the, the, the truth is closer to blame-free than blaming, but blame-free itself is, is too difficult a concept because even certain errors that tend to afflict all healthcare workers afflict some even more. 
you know. And so you're sometimes working with a personnel problem. So the, the culture that I think is taking off most or conceptually is something introduced by David Marks called the Just Culture. And there's a free article you can read that, Dr. Uh, that David Marks wrote. He has a very nice newsletter. We did a great interview of him in our newsletter. It, and it's been very, very helpful is this concept of Just Culture. And the idea is choosing the best response to Discipline. And one of the reasons you don't want to discipline people for these common errors is that they afflict everybody, and then if you discipline them, people are not going to want to report errors, and if they don't report errors, that's going to hurt quality improvement. And in, in the just culture model, which I'll share with you now, um, there's basically what the just, just culture says is it divides errors into three um, behaviors or three types of errors, and then it dictates the response to them. And you can, see, I'll show you why this is helpful. The first error is the, is the honest human error. Those are most cases, uh, the three cases I presented, they would usually be honest human errors. So these are human, honest human errors made in an error prone environment. Why can't I type my name? Okay, it's an honest human error. I'm probably, if we take me and we put me at my desk, and then we do a construction project uh, in, the, in the office at the same time that the guy's there with the ladder changing the light bulb. And then we give me three phones and we ask that me to, um, to answer all three. And then some, and Dave Chu comes by and he says to me, Mike, hold my pager. And, uh, you know, I, if I'm doing enough things, eventually I won't be able to type my name right, and that's what. And we, you can do that to lab workers. You know, you can you, you can uh, sh short staff them, give them lousy equipment, uh, uh, put in uh, mismatch work volume uh, to staffing, and eventually people will start making these errors from lapses in concentration. That's most. Uh, that's what we we would call an honest human error in an error pr uh, prone environment. And most cases, or probably all three cases that we've talked about, belong here. And the response to this error is to console the error and fix the system. Console the error and fix the system. And I'll talk a little bit about fixing the system when I get into more detail about um, interventions. But you console this error. You say, look, this is the kind of error that could happen to anybody, or it happened to me. And uh, that's, how, that's your response. Now, the next kind of error is errors due to at-risk behavior. At-risk behavior, this is like driving 65 in a 55-mile-an-hour zone. It's an at-risk behavior. Why do you do it? Why do you do it? You all do it. You do it because you get there faster. Right? You're rewarded. The reason we take sh every form of shortcutting in healthcare is an, is an error due to at-risk behavior. Why do people wash their hands too fast? This might be the technologist who likes to incubate for 25 minutes instead of 30 minutes. Okay? This is every, every form of shortcutting. You're rewarded for it because it produces time. Now, a lot of times, if you're in a highly stressed environment, you use that time to do other meaningful work. So a lot of times we'll say, oh, look at that nurse. They mislabeled the specimen. We'll try to come down hard. You know, they took a shortcut and mislabeled the specimen. But if you look at that, the environment that that nurse is in, that shortcut actually makes sense because they're borrowing time from labeling, perhaps to give that time to do a better job on the administration of medications. So this errors do at, at risk behavior, all forms of shortcutting. And the response here, it's really two responses here. You still got to look at the system. Like if, you put, if you've short staffed a nursing unit or you've short staffed the lab, that's going, to call, that's going to be an environment where people shortcut. So you still have to look at a six systems response. But given that you have a decent system, if you're able to produce a decent system, then you have to coach and monitor. You have to coach and monitor. So uh, coaching alone is not good enough. That's like training. It's not good enough. But monitoring, where you, know, you randomly look at people's behavior. So this is why like a lot of people... They won't, why, why won't, like my friend tells me the story, he doesn't like to drink milk directly from the container because, because his wife may be watching. <laughs> he wants to drink milk. You can train him that he's not supposed to drink milk from the container, but unless he thinks someone's watching, he will still drink milk from the container. So you want to put in monitoring wherever you put in coaching. That's your response to errors due to at-risk behavior. And there's a lot of different kinds of at-risk behavior. 
um, you know, in the laboratory, but they basically usually come down to shortcutting. Now, the last kind of error is errors due to recklessness. Now, on, ex on the extreme end, this can actually be lawlessness. And you'll see cases, you know, on, in the national news, on CNN, of, you know, this could be the physician who, who diverts drugs from the patient to him or herself because they're a narcotics addict or the, or the nurse who assaults a patient. And in the lab, there's been, there's been publicized clinical cases of people doing so-called sink testing where they just take the, they take the uh, specimen comes in and they pour it down the sink and falsify results. Or there's been cases, uh, criminal cases related to point of care testing uh, where people you know, just didn't do the test and falsified the results. So this is recklessness. And recklessness needs to be punished. There's no, there's no other way around. You can't go blame free. You can't go blame free with the falsification of results. Similarly, there's no, you know, you're not allowed to drink in the lab. You're not allowed to be under the influence of marijuana. And the response to that is to punish. There's no other way. And these cases must be, you know, have to be handled in that way. The difficult part is that, you know, when does an at-risk behavior become recklessness. So recklessness at its, at its extreme, I think we're all able to identify, but what about you know, when, when it's sort of on the border between um, shortcutting and um, recklessness, and that's a little bit more difficult. Now it follows that in a just culture you would expect staff to self-report their honest human errors and at-risk behaviors because they're not being punished. So you're really creating an environment that's a lot be better for error reporting and um, quality improvement. And this is, in fact, what happens. And it also makes sense that you shouldn't, you know, that's why you don't talk about blame-free. Because blame-free is, hey, you can just, you, you know, you can report anything. Well, you, you should not expect people to, to report their reckless behavior. You know, that they, hey, I want to report that I broke the law. People aren't going to do that. You shouldn't expect that they're going to do that. And um, because a just culture is not blame-free. There are certain things that need to be punished. And there's enough of those things, even though they're the small minority of cases, there, there are enough of them that it makes the concept of blame-free not terribly useful. Now let me give you the tough cases for just culture, or any culture for that matter. So here, what is your response to these data? Here you got a rate of data entry errors. These are the percent of, uh, percent of cases requiring data entry of results. So, you know, given that the tech has to enter the data by hand, that there's no interface between the instrument and the laboratory information system, let's say the average tech in that unit has a 0.2% data entry error rate, and then you have a tech A who's got something more than 10 times that, 2.5% greater than the average. And the next lowest performing tech is at 0.4%. Okay, now what do you do? What do you do? See, you know, data entry error is the kind of error that afflicts everyone. We would tend to think of it as an honest human error in most cases, and we should, and we shouldn't punish it. We should think about fixing systems fixes for it. But here you have a tech where it's afflicting them more often. And this, this case is why thinking about blame free doesn't work, because this actually, ha this is not that uncommon. And so what do you deal, what do you, this is what I would call mismatch. This is, you know, maybe it's a euphemistic term, but this is mi mismatch of skills with job duties. And this would afflict all of us if we were put in the wrong job. For example, I'm very, very good at vacuuming. I'm very good at vacuuming. I could be a professional vacuumer. When I vacuum, you see vacuum tracks. It looks good. You want to run your feet across my carpet after I vacuum. I'm, I know how to use all the attachments. I care about the vacuum I purchase. I know all about vacuums. I like to vacuum. But I am not good at interior decorating. If I came to your house and you asked me to interior decorate, you'll get lousy colors. You'll probably get a lot of Seahawks memorabilia on your wall. <laughs> and you won't like anything that I do. I don't know how to match anything. It's going to look, it'd be a mismatch. So you don't want to hire me as an interior decorator. So, so when you see statistics like I just showed you, you have to think that you have mismatch, and that is a personnel issue. Now, you don't have to make it personal, <laughs> but you have to accept the fact that this person is mismatched for their job, and the only solution is to confront that. Now, in a case of chronic mismatch, where this goes on for a long time, you either have to move the person to a better fit if they're fortunate or terminate. There's no other way around this. And it doesn't really matter how nice the employee is, because from the patient's perspective, they just don't want errors happening to them. It doesn't matter if nice people are committing them. Now, temporary mismatch, temporary mismatch is actually a, a, a pretty big problem 
and it really can afflict almost anyone. And most people can relate to this. A classic example would be bereavement. It's very hard when you're, where you have a bereavement or any major life change, and that can lead to a lot of these lapses in concentration and inability to do um, tasks that are normally automatic. Now, the best response there is to not come down too hard, but rather, but but you still have to take that person off of patient care duties because the patient doesn't care. Patient care, you just want to reduce the error rate. So here is where temporary leaves from patient care duties would, would come into play. So mismatch is a real thing, and there's an, it's, it's not the most common you know, cause of error. Usually they're honest human errors that you can take a blame-free approach to, but there's enough mismatch to make the concept of blame-free not that helpful and to make the just culture concept quite a bit better. Another tough case it involves uh, what I was just talking about previously related to when does, when does at-risk behavior become reckless. So I'll just give you an example. Despite being warned twice, a tech forgets to ask for readback. Read back. So they give an oral result and they forget to ask the provider to tell them what they just said. And that contributes to misinterpretation of a hepatitis C result because about 1% of oral communication is erroneous. And there's been some recent papers even in the laboratory literature about this. And it, it leads to misinterpretation of a hepatitis C result and a suboptimal treatment. So the question I asked you is when does this at-risk behavior get reclassified as a reckless behavior? You know, you do it once, you know, you, you do it twice, you're warned. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a lapse in concentration. You just don't like to do it. The same can be said of hand washing, you know, if you see a person not washing their hands. And there's not a simple answer to this question. It depends a lot on the culture of where you work. When at-risk behavior moves to reckless behavior depends a lot on the culture of where we work. Some, some hospitals are very, very intense about hand washing, very intense. And they'll only give a couple of warnings if they see a healthcare provider not wash their hands before seeing a patient. And then severe action is taken. Others will warn many, many, many times. And there's no simple answer, but there is, there is a continuum between at-risk behavior and recklessness. And you can see, you know, that, that the just culture model is nice because it allows you to put things, you know, on this continuum and make some decent decisions. Now, so we've talked about the disciplinary response, which for the three cases I, I uh, presented would normally be no disciplinary response, uh, except for if you have mismatch or some other uh, extenuating circumstances, uh, mismatch or some kind of impairment. And now let's talk about the interventions to decrease these errors. And first, what I want to do is give you a framework for um, error reduction in general. And this comes from the work of the VA National Center for Patient Safety. A lot of this was given to me by Dr. John Gosby in an interview, and they have a great website for anybody who wants to look at it. And they separate interventions. It's very helpful because they separate interventions in healthcare um, into three, um, three classes. The first is weak, and these are the ones we usually choose. Why do we choose them? Because they're easy. Our, what is the, if you look at the bottom of an incident report, when I was on sabbatical in 2001, I got to look at, I was at the University of California, San Francisco, and I got to look at a lot of different incident reports from a bunch of different institutions and, and talk to a lot of people about incident reporting. The most common intervention that's listed at the bottom of an incident report are call for training, you know, more training, and tell people to be f careful. I told them to be careful. I got them in my office and I told them to be more careful. That's the call for enhanced vigilance. Now, am I going to type my name? correctly the next time because you told me to be more careful? No. Why don't you remove all the distractions and get rid of the pagers and the beepers for a few minutes and maybe I'll be able to type my name correctly. The other weak interventions besides training and call for enhanced vigilance, double checks, warning labels. Have you ever seen the warning label around a hot tub at a hotel pool? There's a warning label of a person diving in the hot tub. Who dives in the hot tubs? Are they going to be prevented by a warning label? Has, has a person ever been about to dive into two feet of water and looked at the warning label and say, hey, I shouldn't dive into two feet of water in a, in a pool that's, that's three feet in diameter? No. It's not very helpful. The other thing with warning labels is you go to certain instruments, they have 40 warning. People have put 40 post-its on, on, the, on the instrument with 40 different warnings. Like, do this, do that. The left button is the right button. The, right, the up button is the down button. It'd be better to get to, to, you know, for the up button to be the up button. Um, so warning label. Memos. People love memos, especially email memos. Email, dear lab, 
Everything you're doing is wrong. <laughs> Love Mike. <laughs> not very helpful, not a strong intervention. Intermediate strength interventions would be things like readback. Readback is a nice intermediate strength intervention. It works. It's been shown to work. Um, and it's been, it's been used in the aviation forever. Workflow adjustments, things like moving batch work to times of optimal staffing, reducing distractions, for example, getting rid of phone distractions or decreasing them in the lab by using a call center, so having specialized call answering. And this is work, you know, we, a number of us visited Mayo Clinic and enjoyed seeing just how few calls they get into the laboratory, just how few phones they have. Now you can start to see that once you get to intermediate strength um, interventions, these are getting harder. They're harder. Calling for training, telling people to be careful, easy. Putting in a call center, tough, because it involves changing the way we do work. Readback's not that tough. Call center's tough. Minor software enhancements, like decreasing manual faxing by using direct faxing from the laboratory information system. This is a nice way to reduce post-analytic errors, and it's an intermediate strength intervention. It's not particularly easy. It's not particularly hard. Checklists can be an intermediate strength intervention. For example, checklists used to verify the accuracy of interfaces to make sure that you're testing for every possible condition by filling out the checklist, making sure you're being thorough. Now, how about the strong ones? Now, the thing about the strong ones is they work, but they're high risk. They're high risk, sometimes very expensive, and if you get it wrong, by high risk, I mean if you get it wrong, you could be in worse shape than when you started. And there are several examples now in the literature of places that, uh, facilities that have implemented computerized physician order entry as an example where it was implemented poorly and they're actually in worse shape with all this computerization than they were uh, with pencil and paper. So strong interventions would be things like major software enha enhancement. And for post-analytic errors, we're talking about things like auto-validation, interfaces between the lab information system and the electronic medical record, and interfaces between instru the instruments and laboratory information systems so that you don't have to enter data. And certainly over the last two or three decades, this is the single biggest reducer of errors, post-analytic errors in the lab, is the elimination of data entry as, as a way of getting rid of uh, data entry error, and that's certainly been a major triumph in clinical laboratories. Physical plant changes, for example, uh, you, those of you who work at UW know that we have an automation zone um, and that where the instruments are closer to um, processing. Elimination of steps, for example, the LIS instrument interface gets rid of data entry. You get rid of that step. You get rid of an error-prone step. You get rid of errors. So that's very, very helpful. Equipment standardization, like call center, one type of remote printer so that the person who has to repair the downstream printer doesn't have to have the uh, knowledge of 25 different kinds of uh, printer. And then lastly, involvement by leadership in patient safety. And by that, I mean tangible involvement of leadership in patient safety, not me sending you a memo. It's me saying, we have a certain amount of money, and we're going to give it to you now for a patient safety project, or us get, you know, getting behind a, 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 like the automation zone project, you know, and, and the physical plant remodel. It's, and it's the management doing things like that. Now, I don't, you know, people say, what do you mean training's useless? It's not always useless. Training is weak on its own, but it's an essential part of stronger interventions. If you're teaching people how to function in the call center or uh, use, you know, new instrumentation, Training's important, and memos are weak by themselves, but they're useful for communicating, um, especially from uh, management, you know, project timelines. You know, here's how the big patient safety project's going. We're on time, we're not on time. Here's why. Uh, milestones in the project. That's where memos can be very, very useful. Now let me apply these concepts to the three cases that we discussed. First one was data entry error, intervention strength as applied to data entry error. So we're going to take this VA National Center for Patient Safety list and apply it to these. So what would be the weakest? Retrain the technologists. Retrain the fingers. Get them to enter the data right. Tell them to slow down. There's a patient behind the result. Can't you slow down? Can't you type right? Let's send you to typing school. Show you a picture of the keyboard. This is the A. <laughs> Weak but better would be the same exact thing, but having the supervisor walking around terrorizing them. You know, so scared that you can't possibly make a mistake. It's better, but it's weak. Intermediate would be redundant data entry. This is where two people enter the data, unknown, not unknown to each other, but independent of each other, and the result only goes out if they agree. And this is not actually used in clinical labs. It works. 
and it's used in certain high-risk um, industries, and it's used where database integrity is very important and certain research protocols. And it could, I could actually see a way for it be, to be used in certain parts of the clinical laboratory. Um, but in general, it's, it works, but it's not that useful because it takes just an awful lot of labor, and with the current labor shortages, it's not that um, useful. Now, a more, a more useful intermediate one is redesign of forms, especially computer forms and data entry fields, so that, so that you can't um, accidentally, uh, you know, accept results very, uh, incorrect results very easily, or that it's easier to enter the data in a coordinated way and put it in the right field. So this you'll see, you see a lot of, and I think it's a nice intermediate one. It doesn't cost that much. Now, what is the strong one for this? The strong one for this is interfaces between the instrument, computer interfaces between the instrument and the lab information system so you don't have to enter data. Now, this won't work for manual tests, but for anything on an instrument, it's always high priority to get these interfaces in, and it will get rid of a lot of the data entry errors. You're still going to have to enter data because there's always some reason, like in the troponin case, where you know, normally it would go over an interface, but there's often a reason where you have to manually enter. Similarly, interfaces between the electronic medical record and the lab information system um, can reduce error if it's done right. Strong interventions are difficult to implement and sometimes expensive. And I want to thank, um, for the next couple slides, my colleague, Dr. Dave Chu, um, regarding uh, the, the concepts here, and then a, uh, the next slide is a nice image that I think illustrates the point. Strong interventions are difficult to implement. So let's look at interfaces. Implementing an electronic medical record is hard. Interfacing the lab information system to the electronic medical record is hard. And so if you take a high quality patient data in the lab information system and now do this high risk interfacing project and you do a bad job with it, so now you've got an expensive, high risk, high labor project and you do a lousy job with it, you'll get erroneous data in the electronic medical record. And Dr. Chu has actually collected these things from colleagues, these kinds of errors. He has a whole PowerPoint presentation of various kinds of interface errors from various places. I just chose two that he gave me. This is this result re regarding schistosomiasis is perfectly clear in the laboratory information system, and this is what it looks like in the downstream electronic medical record. Does this patient have schistosomiasis? I don't, I don't even know myself. I don't even remember what the right answer is. But there's no way the provider's going to know. The provider calls the lab. They're like, you can't read? Because in the lab system, it looks perfect. Same with this lupus inhibitor result. And what you have here actually is the unhiding of the reference range and it's, it's causing a misinterpretation of the result. Not present is the reference range, as is negative for the lupus inhibitor. Here's one where a flag, a flag, this is the way it should look, AST 12, low, a low flag, is in lowercase letters and nested in real tight to the result. So it looks like 121. Nice tenfold error. And so these are confusing electronic medical record displays of data that looks perfect in the lab information system. And so the only intervention for this kind of problem, so this is the right solution for data entry errors is computerization, but you have to do it right or you're going to be in worse shape than when you, when you start it. And you're going to have new errors that you've never seen before. 3,000 tests can be resulted in 30,000 different ways in one downstream electronic medical record system. What does that mean? You've got to do a lot of testing. I do a lot of testing before you put these things um, online. There's no other way. How about oral miscommunication? Let's apply the intervention strengths um, concepts to oral miscommunication. The weakest would be to retrain the technologist, tell them this is how you communicate. When the result is negative, you say negative. <laughs> or when the result is on March 11th, you give them the March 11th result. That's how you do it. You don't give them the March 1st result. We're going to have to send you to March 1st, March 11th differentiation training school. <laughs> See? That's not the way, it's not going to help. It makes, the, it may make you feel better to say that to somebody. It feels good to blame people. It feels good. But it's not going to help. Tell them to slow down. And say it right. Find the right answer. Intermediate here would be read back. Read back works, especially if you have documentation, if you're you know, asked to document the read back. And with audit, this is a form of monitoring, right? The form of monitoring would be audit to make sure we're actually reading back. And the strongest would be call center with, and redesign of result screens so that it becomes very difficult to choose an old result. And um, there's a nice study recently in the lab literature by Baronfanger regarding the, um, how well readback actually works in the laboratory environment for eliminating the oral miscommunication of result. So that's, 
Strongest is call center, though, where you have a group of employees who just do the phones. That's hard. That's hard, and it can be expensive, too. How about the last case? The last case is physician forgets to follow up on test order. Now, this one is one of the favorites for blaming. People love to blame the physician. They love to blame the physician. You know, he ordered the test. Why doesn't he, why doesn't he get it? Isn't it important to him? Well, there's a lot of tests ordered, and people are asked to see, a, physicians are asked to see a lot of patients. And this, this is a conceptual uh, framework for thinking about interventions for physicians and other providers who forget to follow up on test orders. The weakest interventions are, you know, are the systems we generally see in place in most hospitals, which that MD, this, and these are called pull systems. MDs are forced to pull the data out of the electronic medical record or the paper record for, or the lab information system for all the patients they see. What if you saw 30 patients that day and you ordered 10 tests on each? That is a tremendous burden of pulling. That's typical. This is typical. Now, as you move over this way and get to stronger interventions, these are what we call push methods. And in the most extreme push methods, we're pushing the results onto people where we're actually calling them, like a critical value. We're calling them and saying, hey, and you have to reach them, and you reach them, and you say, doctor, this is the result. You're pushing it on, and it's an important result. Phone MD directly and receive readback, or the LIS pages the MD with a wide who has a widescreen pager. These are push methods. Now, you can see that you don't want to use a push method for every result because you'll drive people crazy and, and make it impossible for them to use, do their job. But you don't want to use completely pull methods either. They're not effective either because it puts too big a burden on the physician. And what, so what's evolving is sort of what, what, what we would call soft push messages, like sending results to an MD's electronic inbox, and the only thing that's sent are results that are flagged as abnormal. That's a nice, that's a good example of a soft push method. In the UW system, you see that really beautifully used in our interaction with uh, the UW um, Physicians Network clinic, clinics. You know, we have a very nice system for, for pushing um, numeric results with, er with um, you know, abnormal flags, you know, that this result is norm, uh, abnormal, and it appears on their screen in a different color and is flagged. And then, you know, phoning third parties who relays the results to MD, that's another form of a little bit stronger push. So these stronger ones, um, they work, but you, ha you can't, it's like the string around the finger, you can't tie too many strings, you can't use it for every single result. Last thing I want to talk about are critical values, and the main thing that people need to know is that critical value policies are imperfect and there's no way to make them perfect. They cover only a small fraction of tests. They're usually not unit specific. You know, people, units would, you know, cardiac care would like their own set of critical values versus some other unit, but it's very hard to make them unit specific. They're imperfectly executed because they're overly dependent on third party communication. We would like to reach the physician directly or the person taking care of the patient directly. That is not always possible. And so you have to send it to a third party. Anytime there's a third party, there's a um, uh, higher chance for an error. The strongest intervention here is a form of automation and computerization, which is direct paging from the information system to the physician pager. But this has been very, very difficult to implement. And there's only a handful of places in the country that have even been able to implement. And even at those places, it's not been, some of them have not been implemented well. But that's what you would like, is, to, is you know, to know who the provider is, which is no easy matter, because there's different shifts during the day and on the weekend, and to send them the result directly. And there's a couple nice papers about that that I reference here. It's, a ver it's definitely the strongest and best intervention, but there's, it's not been able to get into common practice yet, and we certainly look forward to the day um, when it can. I just want to uh, have a couple of concluding slides, but I want to uh, acknowledge my colleague uh, Dave Chu for a lot of the ideas in the talk and for uh, being a sounding board for a lot of things in the newsletter and for some of the slides here. And I extend that to my colleagues in the University of Washington Department of Lab Medicine who's helped me with regard to thinking about errors over the last several years. John Gosby at the VA for the information related interventions. David Marks for his work on just culture. Sidney Decker for his work on the drift into catastrophic fail failure. And the entire board of editors of the Laboratory Errors and Patient Safety Newsletter. In conclusion, I think, you know, I've shown you some cases, composite cases, clearly post-analytic lab errors can harm patients. It feels good to call for weak interventions like more training and enhanced vigilance. Be careful, but these are weak. We need to choose, labs need to choose intermediate or strong interventions.
realize that they're higher risk and maybe higher cost, and implement them carefully uh, to get the most out of them. And acceptance of strong interventions will often, especially when it involves automation or uh, large changes in the way we do work, will require a preceding culture change. Thank you. Thank you.